dear friends, we're going to continue with our service. It's uh, decisions first things first. And um, I want to talk a little bit just for a second about some of the brethren here in Grand Rapids. I want to bring you the love and greetings from your brethren here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This was a picture taken uh, earlier this fall, I think in uh, maybe October. We still had the nice weather that you referred to, Brother Gary, but it's been a blessing to be with us. And uh, Milwaukee certainly has a special bond uh, with all of us in Grand Rapids. On a little bit of a sad note, I want to inform you, you may or may not have heard, but Brother Gene DeWeiss, uh, Brother Gene DeWeiss passed away uh, on the 21st of October. Uh, his wife, Sister Mary, is is pictured with him, um, but uh, Brother Gene uh, was an elder in the class and uh, very close with a lot of us in the uh, in the Grand Rapids uh, Ecclesia. So just wanted to inform the friends. Um, they'll probably have a service for him maybe in the spring uh, after the COVID is perhaps a bit more manageable. I want to bring you special love and greetings from Brother Leo and Sister Joanne Holmont. Um, they're a big part of our class. They did move a little bit further north. Uh, to be closer to their family, but they still have a soft spot in all of our hearts. And you see them here with uh, some of their biggest fans in Grand Rapids. We're privileged to, to be with uh, Brother Leo and Sister Joanne. Certainly have to bring the love of my mom, Sister Helena Malinowski. This was taken a little bit earlier uh, in October. She's doing well. She is in assisted living, but fortunately we are able to bring her uh, back and forth to her home or to our home uh, just to get some getaways, but she is in assisted living and doing well. Um, want to bring you the love and greetings of our two boys, Will and John. Uh, with COVID, uh, limited with conventions and seminars and things like that. We took advantage of some trips uh, to Northern Michigan and really enjoyed the summer as best as we could. And Brother Gary, as you know, um, we're on the uh, east side of Lake Michigan. You're on the west side, about 190 miles away, or maybe not, maybe about 100 miles away. But uh, we get your weather and we've had a splendid fall uh, so far. But uh, greetings from Will and John. And certainly I can't, I can't forget uh, Sister Sarah, my, my wife, and certainly her mother, Sister Elva Anderson, both wanted their love sent as well. Um, I want to pause just for a moment and recognize our Brother Lawrence Kirkham and his wife, Sister Jean. Um, as I get into my talk, you'll understand a little bit more about uh, Brother Lawrence's impact or influence. But I listened to one of his talks. It's called Decisions Great and Small. And he gave that at Antioch in 2006. And uh, there's a part in here that really uh, influenced me. And I'll share that with the friends. And certainly our brother Charles uh, Russell, uh, there's an article in his uh, sermon book. Uh, it's called Decision and Character Building. Um, I took some excerpts out of that and I really encourage the friends. But the reason I bring up brother Lawrence and brother Charles as, as many more is uh, a quote by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And you see that there, he said, if I had seen further, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And again, that's, uh, we, we, we must recognize our peers and certainly all the brethren that have gone before us. So we're gonna continue friends. Um, so let us begin. Um, recently, I made a personal decision that I thought was the right one. I prayerfully considered the facts of the matter I projected the possible outcomes. I spoke with several others about it, and I felt pretty good about the decision that I had made. Unfortunately, after I made the decision and the wheels of motion were put in play, I was clearly shown that my decision was not the best one. Like all of you, we make many decisions each and every day, some large, some small, but all very important in our Christian walk. Even though I did my best in preparing for my decision, the slowly evolving result was a negative outcome. I move forward. I accept, I respect, and I appreciate the opportunity to be humbled, to learn and better shape my character. As we know so well, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28, Romans 8.28. Even though the outcome may not be immediately beneficial to me, I cannot quite see it yet. I am quite certain that the Lord will overrule and direct my life and help me learn and understand the lesson that he has for myself. This is the important part that perspective plays in our decision making. Let's see things from God's perspective 
and we can all make better decisions that are in accordance with God's will. A 2018 study from Cornell University estimates or estimated that the average adult makes about 35,000, yep, 35,000 remotely conscious decisions each and every day. Each decision, of course, carries certain consequences with it that are either good or bad. Likewise, with every decision we make, we may use either good or bad judgment. The mental faculty of judgment is the final filter of our thoughts before we lead with our words, with our words, with our work, and with our hands, or move with our feet. In our lives, judgment is both a privilege and a responsibility. It is a privilege to lead our life by it, and it is a responsibility to teach it to our children, our family, our friends. We let our light shine through the use of godly judgment in our decisions. King Solomon showed us by the example of his life that we establish our families in righteousness with the proper use of judgment. As a platform, judgment has far-reaching influence and power that leads to every good work. Solomon's use of poor judgment later in his life shows us how we too can fall from God's favor through our use of ungodly judgment in our decisions. King Solomon wanted us to be successful. He stated that good judgment begins with our heart's commitment to mercy and truth. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and men. Proverbs 3, 3 and 4. Proverbs 3, 3 and 4. And also, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Proverbs 3, 8. Proverbs 3, 8. In the last verse of Proverbs 1, wisdom tells us that if we listen to it, we will live safely, quietly, and without the fear of evil. Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Proverbs 133. Proverbs 133. Learning good judgment and decision making is a task to which we must set our minds. This is where King Solomon had an advantage over us. His mind was flooded with wisdom and the precepts of good judgment by our Heavenly Father. We, however, must focus our mind on God's word, apart from the many distractions of this world. Both King David and King Solomon fell victim to the distractions of the world. Yet, each provides us with beautiful admonitions to, to learn godly judgments in our decisions. Consider the remarkable similarity of the admonitions of King David and his son, King Solomon. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Psalm 19, 9 through 11. Psalm 19, 9 through 11. Now consider the words of his son, King Solomon. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of the days is her right hand and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that hold that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. Proverbs three thirteen through eighteen. Proverbs three thirteen through eighteen. Judgment is our spiritual gyroscope for our personal decisions. It is a sustaining faith mechanism. It is a source of faith for our families. It is the repository of God's wisdom and instruction. The book, of, the book of Proverbs was forged especially for us through man's weakness, but also in God's strength. 
Let us use it as our owner's manual as we approach him to learn his wisdom, his justice, his judgment, and his equity. Then, like King David in Psalms and King Solomon in Proverbs, let us mentor others through the proper use of godly judgment. Life is about making decisions. Most of the decisions we make, we really don't pay attention to. We choose what radio station to listen to or what want to eat for dinner or what movie to go see. We don't spend hours agonizing over decisions like that. The choice presents itself and we make it and most of the time just carry on with the day. Big or small, we are always deciding something, but the big and small are not isolated from each other. In fact, every small decision is in reality a reflection of a larger one. With regard to our working definition of decision, I have to defer to Brother Rick and Brother Jonathan with Christian questions. They use the following to help us understand what is a decision. And this came from an episode of Christian Questions. It was entitled, you know, how do I know if I have made the right decision? And it was broadcast originally on the 16th of December in 2019. Brother Rick and Brother Jonathan brought up a, a wonderful quote by Viktor Frankl. I didn't know about uh, uh, Viktor Frankl until I was informed by Brother Rick and Brother Jonathan, but he's a psychologist and also an Auschwitz survivor. But that quote reads, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Our decision or our decision-making process is in that space between stimulus and response. We also recognize that a proper decision is one that is in harmony with the Lord's will, in harmony with truth and with righteousness. And finally, a decision without compromise. So we appreciate Brother Rick and Brother Jonathan for their help with that. Our topic of decisions reminds us about the wonderful character Joshua and his expiring words. If it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land did dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. Again, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So how is that for making a decision? Because of his decisiveness and devotion to God, certainly Joshua was a positive influence on Caleb. And out of those millions that came from Egypt, only he, Joshua, and Caleb were able to step into the promised land. Two, two out of the millions entered the land that was promised to a very special people ancient worthies that would soon rule on earth as it is done in heaven. In quoting from Brother Russell's sermon book, page 755, uh, paragraph one, we read, indecision is one of the greatest foes to character building. This comes from Brother Russell's sermon titled, Decision and Character Building, well worth the reading and study. Like myself, one time much afflicted with indecision, these words apply particularly to me as well as to others with similar weaknesses. What should I do? How should I do it? When should I do it? While the liberty or privilege of choosing, exercising our wills is one of the grandest blessings according to all humanity, and it is an important element of man's likeness to his creator, we see well decision of purpose manifested on every plane of life even by the crawling worm or snail. But the human, more richly endowed by the creator, has a higher range, which includes especially decision in respect to higher moralities, taking hold of questions of justice and love, which affect and influence all of life's affairs. Look where we will. We find that people who are successful in any department of life are those who have purpose and will and determination whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. We see also that those who have no fixity of purpose or intention are limited in their efforts. As the scriptures declare, a double-minded man is unstable 
in all of his ways, James 1.8, James 1.8. And if we look into the teachings of history, we find the same lesson taught by all the past. It may therefore be well settled in our minds that one of the chief difficulties of the majority of the race is lack of decision, indecision of purpose. Who are we? What are we? You and I, dear brethren, are the sum total of our decisions, both good and bad. That's what we are. Choose ye this day, not tomorrow or the next day or sometime maybe. Choose you this day now, right now. How good we feel and at peace when finally we settle matters, put them to rest, and move on to further projects and progress. Even Pastor Russell suggests that even a bad decision can be better than no decision at all. Exercising our wills and making decisions is like the captain, the captain of a ship moving this rudder to and fro to avoid obstacles, to change course prudently, and constantly focused upon reaching port safely. Lack of willpower, indecision, aimlessly drifting through life is like a ship without a rudder, broken, unable to steer a straight, safe course, or make critical corrections swiftly as required to avoid disaster. With time, a strong will guided by God-given principles, making correct decisions, produces a character pleasing to God and possibly successful in the narrow way, which leads to glory, honor, and immortality. Pastor Russell suggests that this development will even change our countenance, the way we look. We paraphrase from his sermon book, page 756, paragraph three, that a well-balanced mind with noble, honorable, exalted purpose, generous and benevolent towards all, is reflected in one's face. The ideal face reflects the higher elements of the mind are in control. The animal instincts for food and raiment have not run away with the manly qualities created originally in the image and likeness of God. It has well been said that we are not responsible for the face we are born with, but we are responsible for the face we die with. Think about that we do control our destiny. Three important early decisions in one's life determine the first future course of that individual. They should be carefully considered in connection with our goals, but too often little thought is given to them. These three primary decisions are first consecration, second marriage or relationships, and third occupation. In a nutshell, our life will be set to course to these three decisions. Let's first talk about consecration. Consecration. We recognize that the world is full of voices calling, follow me. Amongst them is the voice of the Lord calling to follow him. What a privilege to have heard his voice and what an honor. Proverbs 23, 26. Proverbs 23, 26. 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Consecration is the most important decision anyone can ever make. From this one decision, all others will flow. I made this decision to consecrate my life to do the Lord's will, no matter what that might entail at the age of 30. I didn't even know what was in the contract. I did not read the fine print, but I clearly knew that I wanted to do the Lord's will, and I have never ever look back. My decision to consecrate my life to serving my Heavenly Father has been the most influential and beneficial direction of my life's experiences. It has made me rich and joyful in the thing that counts in life and well beyond my worldly expectations. While willing to suffer loss of all things, even life itself, it has brought me riches and pleasures that only the sincerely consecrated can understand and imagine. We cannot even begin to fully grasp what our Heavenly Father has in store for us and the entire world of mankind. The kingdom reality will far exceed our most glorious expectations this side of the veil. Likewise, 
we cannot even imagine the chagrin of some in the kingdom who may reflect back upon their decision to ignore the Lord's call in favor of worldly pursuits and fleeting pleasures. However, due to God's perfect love and his perfect justice, there is no penalty for counting the cost and concluding that the narrow way is more than one is willing to enter and able to walk successfully. Luke 14, 26 through 30. Luke 14, 26 through 30. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not, whoever does not bear his own cross, Whoever does not, I'll continue, uh, sorry. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has had enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. But having counted the cost and decided to consecrate to be successful, we must give it our all wholehearted devotion to serving the Lord, the truth, and the brethren. Now, consecration takes courage, the courage to swim against the flow, the courage to be different, the courage to be strange, the courage to be unusual, and the courage to stand for our Lord, to study, to understand, to believe, and represent the Lord and his truth in word, in thought, in action, when others do not accept it, oppose it, or ridicule it. We do not consecrate to become popular in the world or amongst the brethren who at times we must stand up to. The Bible provides an abundance of comforting and encouraging words which remind us that we are not alone. Let us quote again from Brother Russell's sermon book, page 764. As choice decision was necessary in the accepting of Christ at all, even by faith in our hearts, so another step in decision, determination is reached and tested by our willingness or unwillingness to confess the Lord and his word before others. But the first decision in the heart is the most important step of all. After we have fully and irrevocably given our all to the Lord, it is a comparatively easy matter if our hearts remain faithful to confess him and his word of grace. If it be asked how we shall confess the Lord, we reply that the scriptural program for these is baptism in water, which symbolizes our full consecration even to death, and by which we are symbolically raised to walk in newness of life in our Redeemer's footsteps. This is not to be done for us by our parents when we were infants, nor by our godfathers or godmothers standing sponsors for us, but was to be our, our own individual act after making our consecration and coming to an understanding of the Lord's arrangement. And a little bit more from Brother Russell to close our thoughts on consecration. Let us choose, let us decide today, dear friends, if we have not already decided this most important of all questions. If in the past our course has been a double-minded one, let it not be so in the future. If in the past we have chosen unworthy, selfish ambitions or foolish ones founded on our own surmises or those of others, let us not be content with any of these. But realizing the foundation of truth and of grace let us choose wisely, put our affairs in the hands of the one who is, who is able to bring order out of confusion and to speak peace to our troubled souls and harmony to our discontented lives and whose message by and by is to cause a lessening of the intensity of all the storms of passion and the extreme greed for wealth and gain which are now raging in the world and to bring in that everlasting peace which the Lord has promised under the reign of him who is the Prince of Peace. 
I like this uh, quote or the story. It uh, shows a young man preaching in a square and um, he would witness every day, but on the, on, on the likewise, he would be mocked and laughed at by all those around him. A friend of him asked him one day, he says, why do you do it? Why do you keep preaching in spite of all the taunts and the uh, uh, issues that come up because of it? The young man looked at his friend and answered. He said, I used to do it to change them. Now I do it so they will not change me. Now we move on to the second most important decision, marriage. After consecration comes marriage in determining the first future course of our lives. How excellent is a well-matched compatible mate. Together those blessed with a sound marriage can face, survive, and even yes, enjoy the storms of life that often swamp the lives of those less, less blessed. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Two can accomplish more than twice as much as one. For the results can be much better. If one falls, the other is there to pull him up. Now the wise man declares, whosoever findeth a wife finds a the good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. Proverbs 18.22. Proverbs 18.22. Conversely, how much sorrow and contention come from an ill-advised Ill or unmatched union? The consecrated should, and I say should, consider Paul's advice to marry only in the Lord, to poss possibly manage future difficulties. Doesn't solve everything, but certainly can help. And again, this is not enough. There must be compatibility friendship, tenderness, love, and of course, respect. We also ex accept and respect that not all are interested in marriage and prefer the life the Lord has provided for them. When two consecrated individuals walk together in the Lord, they can strengthen one another, so the result is far greater than if separated. As Aristotle told us, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Who to marry and when is a critical decision and a solemn obligation till death do us part. Marriage, as a type of the Lord and his bride, head and body, should never be considered a frivolous or temporary matter, as we see so often in the world today. For vow making before the Lord is serious business. Numbers 30, verse 2. Number third, Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Before a Christian even enters into a marriage relationship, he or she is seriously responsible for wisely choosing a mate. The bond of marriage is a lifetime commitment and not one to be lightly considered. It makes sense then that our responsibility for a successful marriage begins before we say, I do. So many people today enter into marriage knowing that they have strikes against them, but believing that love will conquer any incompatibilities. No matter how naturally compatible two people are, as any married person will affirm, a content and happy marriage requires work, a lot of work on the part of both participants. Both are on the same team and must work together for mutual growth and for benefit. Why not enter this commitment with every advantage, especially with a shared love and appreciation for our Heavenly Father and his wonderful plan for all mankind? Now, the third great decision we make is that of choosing our occupation. For the consecrated, we are admonished that one's occupation must be honorable in the sense of being upright and decent. Upright and decent, that's it. So these guidelines give us a great deal of latitude in selecting our worldly occupation. It would be best if our occupation should benefit our fellow man and allow the practice of the golden rule, that is treating others the way we wanna be treated. Honesty and truthfulness in our present evil world. This is not so easy to find and accomplish. 
Some that we may come in contact with bend or break the rules with little concern for their conscience or even the effect upon others. Romans 12, 17, Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. We also read in Proverbs 20, 22, Proverbs 20, 22, Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. This principle for our decision in challenging situations is always a wise one to take. That is, sleep on it or get a good night's rest before taking actions on a different difficult matter. Pray, thoughtfully pray, and the Lord will direct you. As a wise friend recently reminded me, the sun will rise again tomorrow. I've had three jobs in my career as an adult. Although I enjoyed my first two and had many wonderful experiences and blessings in each case, I chose to leave both under similar circumstances and incompatibility with principles and practices with my employer. For me, truth in the workplace and truth in our lives is the clearest and easiest path for me to follow. The truth is the way, the only way, both in spirit and in the flesh. Isn't the truth a blessing when we hear it and speak it? Do we hear the voice of the tempter or do we hear the voice of our Lord directing our path? Thessalonians 4, 11, through 12, 11 and 12. Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12. Make it your aim to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to earn your own living. Just as we told you before, in this way, you will win the respect of those who are not believers, and you will not have to depend on anyone for what you need. As Brother Gene Burns often quoted and shared with us, the truth is everything to live for, and the truth is everything to die for. When choosing an occupation, consideration should be given to attending meetings, the needs of our mate or children, time constraints, constructiveness, our own abilities and disposition. And above all, it should be decent and honest in the sight of God and all men. God does not care whether we dig ditches or pilot aircraft but he does care about our work attitude and ethics. Ecclesiastes 9.10, Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever thy hand find to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. I'll share a little hint with you that I try to apply in the workplace. Throughout my day at work, I will often envision one of my coworkers or business associates that I might be having some trouble with as a familiar brother or sister in Christ. By doing so, I am often able to move beyond any personality conflicts. Doesn't always work, but it does help most of the time. Just a thought. Many have contented themselves with humble circumstances like Joseph of old only later to be called up higher and rewarded for their diligence and integrity. Just try to imagine a slave, a slave in prison being called up over time to be the number two man in Egypt, number two, just below the mighty Pharaoh. With his wisdom and clear decisions, Joseph made Pharaoh and all of Egypt wealthy. Seven good years, he gathered up all the harvests of the grain. He had them put into great containers and protected and managed them efficiently. And when the lean years came, what happened? Pharaoh sold Joseph's stored grain and was paid handsomely, for he ended up with the land of all the wealthy nobles of Egypt. No wonder Pharaoh loved Joseph. For me, I am always impressed with brethren that look out for the younger ones in order to allow them opportunities to learn and to grow in the Lord. By providing this fertile ground, these younger brethren can grow on their own and return the favor to bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father. So, dear brethren, these three decisions, consecration, marriage, and occupation, can and will most certainly influence one's whole life, and they should be made carefully, engagingly, and prayerfully. 
Now, the next thought we're going to address about decisions is that prudent individuals seek advice from other, other knowledgeable people when making important decisions. That is, they learn from others. They are smart enough to know that when they can avoid repeating mistakes others have already made and learned by. I've always been impressed with successful people who had this trait. I truly recognize that my earthly father, Brother Tony, is much wiser now, now that we have no longer, that we no longer have him with us than he was when I was growing up. Oh, I'll, oh, how I should have listened to him, watched him, and learned from him more when I had the chance. I long for those words of wisdom, experience, and the time spent together. As Christians, all of us find counsel in the Heavenly Father's word and from those living closely to the word. Paul advises Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our time so spent in God's word places, God's firm, places God firmly in our heart and in our memory where the Holy Spirit can quickly and easily brings, bring God's will to our forefront when we reach the inevitable forks in the road. A seed planted in good soil will take strong root and hold fast. Isaiah 30, 21. Isaiah 30, 21. Thine ear shall hear a word behind, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. So advice and direction from experienced mature minds is invaluable, particularly from the word of God. But it is our responsibility to weigh matters and make the right decision. Let's be curious, brethren, and let's not be afraid to ask questions. Let us learn from that which our Heavenly Father has already provided to us. Now we turn from these mighty, weighty matters to some day-to-day -day decisions that life thrusts upon us. How do we handle them? We must not think that because a matter is small, it is therefore unimportant or, or inconsequential. Carelessness in small things can easily develop into carelessness with larger matters, usually with larger and more serious consequences for all of those involved. We read in the Song of Solomon, 215, Song of Solomon 215, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. I think all of us are familiar with the old adage, watch your pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. This certainly applies to our financial and our worldly requirements, but more so to our spiritual aspirations. A little variation that I've learned and I have enjoyed trying to teach our boys is to always do a little bit more, 10% more. Whatever you are doing, 10% more studying, 10% more training, and so on. By doing a little bit more to the best of our ability, we can and will improve over time. Now a small decision carelessly made can bring us into a situation that is very hard to back out of. It's almost like you take a turn sometimes and it looks like a good pathway to follow, but all of a sudden you're halfway down the road and it's a dead end and we have to go back. And as all of you know, some of us are not good backer uppers. It's hard sometimes to get out of a situation that you have entered into very quickly and easily without thought, but had much greater consequences than you would have imagined. So brethren, let us weigh the consequences of our actions ahead of time and spare ourselves ill-considered and unpleasant results. I'd like to return for a moment to that decision that I referred to at the beginning of our service. As I mentioned, the results were not as I expected, but in accordance with the Heavenly Father's will for me. So with confidence, I can also say that there is almost no situation based on our decisions that we cannot find a way out of. Let us always remember to pause and prayerfully look for and follow God's guiding grace. Both of our sons, Will and John, have taught me or taught us, both Sarah and I, 
that when making a decision, a very good question to ask oneself or another one close to you is, can you accept the possible outcomes of the decision you are about to make? Can you accept the possible outcomes of the decisions you are about to make? If the answer is in the affirmative, yeah, yes, I can accept the expected outcomes, then you are free to proceed. In light of this thought, please allow me to share the first of two poems I'd like to share with you today. Entitled Two Frogs, this is one of my favorites, and it comes to us from the Poems of the Dawn. Two frogs once fell into a deep cream bowl. One of them was an optimistic soul, but the other took the gloomy view. We'll drown, and he cried adieu. So with a last despairing cry, he flung up his legs and said goodbye. Now the other frog said with a plucky grin, I cannot get out, but I will not give in. I will just swim around until my strength is spent. Then I can die a little more content. Bravely, he swam and swam until it would seem that his struggles began to churn the cream. On top of the butter, he finally stopped and out of the bowl, he gladly hopped. So what of the moral? Tis easily found. If you can't get out, keep swimming around. Another principle that guides us when making decisions is to visualize and consider what would Jesus do? We know this from our own studies, our prayer, and certainly from the Holy Spirit. Jesus's life and teachings are the basis for our own life. If in any way we think that Jesus would not approve of our decision or actions, then we should, we should simply not do it. Let us pause and consider what would Jesus do before proceeding with any questionable decisions? The Apostle Paul gives us an excellent basis of what we should fill our hearts and minds with. Let us meditate and measure our thoughts in accordance with Philippians 4, 4 through 13. We know, we know by heart, we all know it by heart, but allow me to verbalize for all of us. Philippians 4, 4 through 13. Philippians 4, 4 through 13. Let your forbearance be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. The things which ye both learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at length ye have revived your thought for me, wherein ye did Indeed, take thought, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, I am there, therein to be content. I know how to be abased. I know also how to abound. In everything and in all things have I learned the secret both to be filled and to be hungry, both to abound and to be in want. I can do all things in him that strengtheneth me. So what we think about, brethren, leads to what we do. Actions are first approved in the mind. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Our destiny is tied directly to and starts with our thoughts. Every idea starts with a thought. Every attitude starts with a thought, but every action starts with a decision. First things first, brethren, this is why I changed my title. I really wanted to kind of bring this point out and uh, I appreciate the friends allowing me to do so. Now we'll go into the rule or guide of first things first. 
I got this from Brother Lawrence Kirkham, and I have adopted it in my own life, in my own walk. This consists of a list of priorities we should consider when making decisions. It can help us choose between conflicting interests, responsibilities, mortgages on our time and energy. All of us have these challenges due to our fallen nature. It is our flesh. The rule at the top of our first things first checklist when preparing to make decisions is to remember that God and our consecration to him are always or is always, always comes first. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 19 and 20. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have from God, and ye are not your own. And also 1 Corinthians 6.20, 1 Corinthians 6.20. For ye were bought with a price, glorify God, therefore, in your body. He bought you and I, he possesses you and I, and you and I are his servants, as well as his sons. So this is our first consideration when making decisions, our Heavenly Father and our consecration to him. Coming in at number two on our list, if married, our spouse comes next. Marriage brings with it a mortgage on time and energy, but most, but must not come before our higher, higher mortgage to our God. Number three, if there be children, then follow their interests. Number four, our brethren come, but not at the expense of those above. Number five, our employer claims the right of an honest day's work, and this claim must be honored faithfully. If in conflict with above, we can change our work situation for one more compatible, but we do owe our employer an honest day's work if we want an honest day's pay. Number six on our list comes neighbors or family and friends and community. And finally, number seven, we might say comes personal interests that we might deem selfish, unimportant or unnecessary in our consecrated walk. I will let each of you fill in this final category as you see fit. You know, one other thing I, I really appreciate was uh, Brother Paul Malley many years ago taught me and he might have taught you as well that we need to schedule. We need to schedule the priorities for our time for the Lord. We have phones, we have uh, calendars, we have stick it, stick them notes. Um, you know, we need to set up time for our Heavenly Father and also for ourselves. I like the quote there by Stephen Covey. It says, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, meaning it's not the schedule, but the key is to schedule your priorities. Just as an example, relative to COVID, um, I like to swim. But now with COVID, when I go to the Y, I have to call, I have to schedule with an app. I schedule the time, the lane, the date for me to swim. And I set aside 45 minutes a day to swim, you know, to clear my mind, to clear some exercise. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But friends, take advantage and make sure to schedule your priorities, however you want to do that. Bodily or physical needs, like our own needs, are also important. It is obvious that while being spent in service to others, the basic needs of our fallen flesh must be met or ill health follows. We all need adequate, balanced food, exercise, and sleep to have sufficient energy to carry out our responsibilities to our Heavenly Father, our families, and our brethren. We are all reminded of Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23, 1 Timothy 5.23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and my own infirmity. But if not careful, the flesh will demand more and lead to self-gratification, which can severely hinder our spiritual development and health. So we need to take care for sleep. We have to have sustenance. We should get proper exercise, but not let it overwhelm us and become a bad habit. Let us take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. An additional thought comes from Brother Joe Migas, and I really appreciated this thought. And he shared with us, when the mind is tired, exercise the body. When the body is tired, exercise the mind. Finally, we come to the sobering thought that the Lord's people are being trained to be judges. Now he who would lead must first learn to follow. And if we're going to be judges on the other side of the veil, 
We must learn to be good judges on this side of the veil. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And as the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? No, you shall not judge angels. How much more the things that pertain to this life. What a glorious privilege and honor we may find before us. The key to making these decisions properly is instilling the principles of righteousness into one's mind and quickly applying them to the choice one must make. What man is he that feareth the Lord? He shall teach him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Psalm 25, 12. Psalm 25, 12. Thus, a Christian who knows he has committed himself to the service of God need not ponder long about accepting such services divine providence offers, nor are decisions between right and wrong and moral matters to be submitted to continuous analysis, but made resolutely, quickly. This is not to say that all such decisions are easy, or even that they will always be made correctly. It is a true adage that a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Proverbs 24, 16. Proverbs 24, 16. It is not a moral sin to take the wrong path at a crossroads in life, but it can become so after discovering it is the wrong road to lack the humility to admit the course is wrong and reverse one step. A sevenfold rising again must follow the sevenfold falling of the just man. This calls to mind the anecdote of the wise man who was approached by one of his disciples with the question, Master, how did you get to be so wise? By making good decisions, responded the sage. But how did you learn to know which were the good decisions? The disciple persisted. By experience, he answered. And how did you get experience? By making bad decisions, the old man replied. Decisiveness is a strong asset in character building. When decisions are made correctly, they produce a sense of well-being. When the wrong decisions are made, they provide opportunities to learn valuable lessons and improve our walk with the Lord. King David provides a classic example of someone who made a wrong decision. His sin with Bathsheba was one of the greatest, was one of the greatest magnitude, involving as it did adultery, lying, and murder. It was a sin that cost him dearly when the child conceived with Bathsheba died, yet he remained a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22. Acts 13, 22. God's permission of evil is not a valuable way to teach mankind the benefits of serving truth and righteousness rather than error and wickedness. It is also an instrument to teach the consequence of wrong decisions. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7, Galatians 6, 7, is a succinct statement of the moral law that every action has an equal reaction. It is a true adage that the mark of maturity is the willingness to accept the consequences of one's own actions. Once the price for error has been paid, much profit is gained if the lesson learned is applied to future decisions. Well did the young man Elihu say to Job, let us choose unto us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. Job 34.4, Job 34.4. Adam Clark catches the thought with these words, let us not seek the applause of victory. Let our aim be to obtain correct views and notions of all things, and let us labor to find out what is good. May every Christian base his decision in, in an endeavor to obtain a correct view and let each labor to make the right decision in life, finding out that which is good. I'd like to close with the second poem that we promised you, a poem from our dear brother, Carl Hagensick, entitled Crossroads, Crossroads, Brother Carl for you. As we walk the narrow way, how our feet so yearn to stray, help dear Lord, we seek and pray guide us now to perfect day. Oft we look to left and to right, trying hard to main and right, main and might, lacking still that inner sight, blinded by the mists of night. Seeking at our paths crossroads, 
knowing not where each way bodes, how we need your hand to hold, leading us to heavenly folds. Show us, Lord, which path you trod, which, we ask, led you to God. Hesitant, we onward plod, looking for your proving nod. Only let us seek thy will, doing not what worketh ill, choosing rightly to fulfill vows we've made and want them still. Decisions are so hard to make, fearing that we would forsake. Paths we've promised that we'd take, this we pray for thy name's sake. And again, that's our dear brother Carl Hagensick. With that blessed thought from Brother Carl, we close our service. May the Lord continue to guide and direct you in all that you do and decide. May the Lord add his blessing. Amen.